All right. Okay. What have you um, yeah, I'm ready anytime. Oh, it's yeah, I was doing it for you in a do an introduction. This is in the space of one week. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to B-Sides Detroit. Uh, and thank you for having me back. This is a thrill. Uh, I promise no Star Wars copyrights were damaged uh, in the creation of this presentation. Uh, so I'm assuming Disney won't sue me. Um, I do want to tell you up front, though, what I have done here. And this is an extension of if you saw me do some of the Star Wars stuff, I talked a little bit about my home network. I'm now going to talk a whole lot about my home network uh, and some of the things I'm doing in it. Uh, as a consequence, I'm going to have to warn you up front uh, that there may be inappropriate language, um, comments, thoughts, etc. Uh, I collected things from random people that would connect to my network, uh, so I have really no, you know, guarantee in terms of, you know, what you might see or, or hear here. So in that case, uh, if you're easily offended, uh, you might want to leave the room. No one? No, you're not easily offended. You guys seem like a pretty solid, solid group. One thing I want you to keep in mind: 
when everything I'm about to show you, absolutely no certificate trust was harmed during the making of this presentation. I did no SSL injection. I did no gathering of anything by decrypting SSL. And that's important to keep in mind, because unlike the NSA, I can't really crack SSL. Although apparently they don't need to anymore. They just collect it. Isn't that great? The timing of that on my way here was like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, <clears throat> just a little bit about me. If, if you follow me at all, actually, you'll find me on Twitter. I'm, I'm fairly busy on Twitter. Uh, I get a lot of wonderful comments from people on Twitter. Thank you. Uh, it's always great to be, uh, you know, uh, identified and noticed. I, I think it's because I'm so helpful. For example, uh, one Valentine's Day, this woman asked, you know, she was looking for something that was going to make his eyes pop out of his head, uh, which I suggested sudden decompression in an airtight chamber. <laughs> With help like that, right? Um, also, uh, I follow, you know, technically one of my competitors, but, you know, I like to follow a lot of people on Twitter and get involved in some of the things they do. For example, you know, what do I see as a, f as a future of security threats to Twitter? To which I responded, they probably use your product to protect it. <coughs> they didn't think it was as funny as I did. Come on, it's a joke. <coughs> We're all friends here. I have to confess, though, for all the wonderful things people have said about me and, and to me, uh, occasionally there's some people that aren't thrilled with some of the things I say. Um, and I understand that. This is an open community. And I bring that up because if you do want to challenge, question, argue, of course, please do that. That's part of what we do here, and that's part of how we learn and evolve. Uh, I'm a big boy, and I'll be able to handle it. Uh, and it's you know pretty much like my old IRC days, right? I like to have a little fun, a little argument, a little debate. Uh, it's always exciting. Does anybody remember IRC? It was like Facebook before we had you know <laughs> colors and pictures and everything. So with that, let me introduce to you weaponized security. Now, first off, let me say, if you came into the session expecting me to teach you how to turn your computer into this you know, horrible weapon, that's not really going to happen. Yes, that was a real article quite a few years ago. You can tell by the computer there. Uh, I thought that was very amusing, but I've actually had a few friends, not very computer savvy, going, oh, can this happen? Should I be worried? Will my AV stop this? <sighs> so where this story starts, actually, so I, I, without, uh, this isn't a, a vendor pitch, but I, I work for a security vendor, and as a consequence, I've had access to some pretty high-end security technologies uh, pretty much at will. Uh, as a consequence, I've essentially raised my children with my firewall. So if I go back 10 years, uh, you know, back when life was a little simpler, uh, when my daughter first started getting on the Internet, uh, I had a very simple policy for her that allowed her to go to pretty much all the places she wanted to uh, because she really only ever went to a couple of places, Barbie.com, WB Kids, a few places, and she could go anywhere else she liked. But if that happened, an SMS was actually sent to my phone to let me know what was happening. And one day, she went to a website called funnyjunk.com. And I happened to be in Dallas at one of our tax centers doing some work. And lo and behold, in comes this little SMS saying that uh, she went to funnyjunk.com. This is before you could really browse the web on your phone. The best I could get was an SMS. So I walked over the internet, punched it up, I looked, and I'm like, ooh, it was a cartoon. Uh, but it was not really appropriate for an eight-year-old. She was, you know, was dancing penises and stuff on it. So I, I, I picked up the phone and I quickly called home to my wife and I said, listen, you better check on Taylor. I think she's looking at something she shouldn't. My wife responds, oh my God, how did you know? She, she has no idea what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> she still doesn't actually. But uh, I, I said, well, you know, I, you know I, I was just keeping an eye on things. I said, I said, did you notice? And she goes, well, yeah, she, she received this URL from a kid at school. She came home, she punched it in. My wife saw it. They were just in the middle of having a conversation about it uh, when I happened to call. Um, so as time went on, of course, this didn't really scale as, as a process. I couldn't keep calling home every time a, a URL came up. And of course, as time went on, it got crazier and crazier. The applications were coming at me fast and furious. Uh, and as I discovered, as I'd watch how my children use the Internet, um, they use social networking very, very different from me. For example, I, you know, I started with LinkedIn because everybody had LinkedIn for work, but I didn't really use it much. And then you know, I kind of got into this Twitter thing because I thought it was cool. I talked to a few people with some interests. Uh, and I like the fact that they kept down 140 characters so nobody could ramble on. And then, uh, you know, the Facebook. And at that point, I'm like, eh, you know what? I don't have time for anything else. I'm done. My kids, on the other hand, seem to connect to any social network randomly. Uh, it changed all the time. Uh, it, over a course of a week, she would log into, you know, seven to ten different social networking sites. And then within a week or two after that, they would all change. But she's still logging into just as many. And then something happened that made me have to go down and talk to my daughter. She's in her teens at this point. 
And that was, she actually uh, opened up an account uh, at the Arizona Real Estate Board, uh, a messaging board, uh, listed as social networking and categorization, but I I'm thinking, why on earth does my kid from Toronto need to go to the Arizona Real Estate Board? And she went in and actually created a, a, with a zip code and everything, she'd done her research to appear. And of course, her friends would come over and they join my Wi-Fi and I get to see what they're doing too. We're all joining it as well. So I had to finally go talk to her and say, what is it you're doing here? And she explained to me, it was, it's actually high school all over again. Uh, and that is, so first off, uh, the first alarming thing I discovered was that Facebook was for old people. Uh, and that was really just the face that she used to put up in front of mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. Uh, it was really nothing, you know, uh, uh, not a real life. Her real life was going on in all these other different social networks. But even with that, she had friends that, you know how they like to have their little clicks? So they go out and anything to my kids where you're allowed to post or share information is social networking to them. They don't give a crap what it's called or where it's located. So they would create these accounts, sign up, and then they would tell just a couple of good friends who would join in too with their random names and their random emails. And they would all talk and then they'd tell a few friends, tell a few friends, and then it would get bigger and bigger and finally explode till there's so many people they go, oh, I'm sick of all these people. And they jump to the next social networking site. And this went on and on and on. High school all over again. I feel sorry for the poor people at the Arizona Real Estate Board because a bunch of kids from Toronto came in one day and just blew up the board with a whole bunch of stuff and off they went. But the real irony in all this is while I, of course, is easily trackable across all my social networking, my daughter had actually created a little bit of privacy for herself because she created a new persona, a new identity, in some cases created a new email for every one of these sites that she logged into. Now, she wasn't doing it for any other intention other than she had her little clicks there. She really had no concept of privacy. Uh, but it started to teach me a little bit more about how they're using uh, these tools. So I thought I'd share all the things I've been discovering on this. Now, as time went on, of course, I couldn't just let the kids run rampant, right? That's not a good thing to do. So I started introducing, you know, we had introduced technology for, you know, in-depth in URL filtering. And I got pretty excited about it. I'm like, oh, well, they can't look at any sex sites and I'm going to stop them from alcohol. I don't need to know about alcohol and drugs. They're kids. And I went through and I checked off the list. Of course, I didn't quite think the ramifications of all this, for example, uh, and I applied it to the whole house, not thinking. So, for example, when my wife went to look up a recipe that had alcohol in it, the firewall happily went in and said, oh, no, no, you can't look at that. And I put a block message that said, you know, contact your dad if you really think you need to see this. Uh, so uh, she got a hold of me and she wasn't actually thrilled about the whole setup. Uh, this is, uh, I spent a lot of time on the road, so essentially uh, we talk a lot over Skype, of course, if it wasn't for Skype. So I had to kind of back off from that, I realized. That plus, the kids are getting older, there's too many sites. Uh, and, and realistically, I mean, how many people have dealt with that if you've ever had to do URL filtering for a company? Same kind of challenge, right? People are using it in ways you didn't quite imagine. Um, so I took a completely different approach, and this is more or less how my, my ho house looks at home. I, I went through a period of time where I had anywhere from uh, 8 to 12 servers running at any given time. I've now collapsed everything into a big ESX server. Uh, so even though it's really only one server, it's actually multiple infrastructures. Uh, firewall embedded in there for access to the internet, or the Wi-Fi, and essentially uh, everybody can kind of come into the network and, and do whatever they like, uh, you know, from the family's perspective. Um, I just let them, you know, browse away, but I do log the activity that's going on, try to understand it. Now, because I can interact with uh, my children, as I said, I raised my, my kids with uh, my firewall, um, I started building in, you know, messaging systems for them. Uh, to try to deal with some of the challenges I had. And one of them was uh, my kids would stay up all night browsing the web, and then they'd get up in the morning and go, oh, Dad, I don't feel well. I, my stomach's, oh, it's upset. I got a headache. I, I think I better stay home. And we're like, oh, geez, the poor kid's sick. Uh, but then, of course, I'd you know, later on go back and look at the logs and realize, oh, my God, they've been surfing uh, YouTube all night to like 6 in the morning. Uh, you know, pretty much shut down an hour before I woke them up, and they're like, oh, I feel bad. Um, so I built a customized uh, entry so uh, I could actually go into my logs, uh, I'd create an entry and say, you know, well, any time past midnight, actually it was 2 a.m., uh, if they're browsing around on the internet, uh, a little pop-up comes along and says, you, you know, it's 2 in the morning, probably time to shut it down, and even at that point, that's a little extreme. Uh, and they actually have to agree uh, to my terms of services, right? So I just said in my, hey, uh, do you agree you want to keep uh, surfing? So now, of course, I'm like, oh, Dad, I don't feel well, I feel sick. I, quickly pull up the thing, and go, no, uh, 2 in the a.m. last night you agreed you were going to go to school anyway, uh, off you go. 
have fun. So I, I'm not kidding when I say I actually raise my kids over, uh, over, uh, over uh, my, with my firewall. Of course, you know, this only had to happen to them once, and they learned very quickly, oh, God, i got to go to school tomorrow. I better shut this down. And I thought that was a much easier way to teach them the lesson rather than come in with a heavy hand and say, I'm blocking the Internet. This is terrible. Stop it. Um, it's just a little suggestion there in terms of uh, if you want to monitor and, and watch the kids. Now, you don't always have to use uh, uh, this technology for, you know, essentially warning and hammering people. Uh, actually, at one point, I created an entry similar to this, uh, but I actually coded all the, the family's birthdays in it. Uh, so, of course, my uh, wife went surfing, you know, jumped up on Facebook at 12.01 midnight on the day of her birthday. And uh, lo and behold, uh, up pops a little message. I'll just jump ahead to it. Uh, you know, hey, before you go off to your social networking, just wanted to wish you a happy birthday from Gatekeeper, your hardworking firewall. Uh, she thought that was cute. Now, I also use it for, of course, when my children get, you know, do something bad, they... they get, you know, grounded, and of course part of grounding is they're, they're cut off from the internet, but not exactly. Uh, my daughter forged a note uh, to one of her teachers because she didn't want us to see a, a test that she uh, didn't do so well on. Uh, so for a week, that's all she got to see whenever she tried to connect to the internet. Uh, I'm just informing her if she brings me a signed note from her mom, <laughs> I'll uh, lift it for her. So as a consequence, of course, of having this technology, um, I started to feel pretty, you know, pretty, you know, invulnerable on the internet, right? I got it all. I'm safe. There's really no problems here. I mean, you know, 10, 15 years of security experience. Come at me. What do you got? This would be just interesting to me. And of course, I regularly get attacked from the outside. Since I don't let a whole lot of services into my house, uh, not really a big deal. I don't really care. I more or less collect them and just go, wow. Uh, I remember a time when, uh, when I first started, I put uh, one of Canada's first banks online. And at that point, you know, if we saw an attack every, you know, couple of days, it was uh, amazing. You know, usually it was, could go months without anyone doing any kind of serious things. And over time, that shrunk till now within five minutes of coming online, right? You have people scanning and looking. But what's more interesting for me is when the outbound stuff, what we're picking up in terms of where I'm going. For example, uh, one time I, I noticed I, I got a, 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 it was a PNG exploit for uh, Internet Explorer. And I thought, geez, what, where did I even hit that? I don't even remember going anywhere malicious. And I went and looked up the URL, and actually, then it suddenly hit me. It was a Sunday. I had to work in the lab. Uh, I really wanted to catch the Eagles game, uh, the Eagles-Giants game, but I didn't, you know, I couldn't really leave the lab. I didn't want to drag the TV over. So I thought, maybe I can just catch it online. And I literally just looked at this web page and thought, eh, it looks a little shady. I'm not going to bother. But, of course, according to my firewall, it actually already had tried to, uh, to exploit me. And, of course, it's hitting my family uh, all the time. Uh, but I don't really worry about it, of course, because not only do I have that protection, uh, we're actually a family of Macs. Uh, when Vista came along, it was the decision to make that I uh, was moving away from the PC world. Uh, and uh, at that point, all my family's running Macs, so I'm feeling extra invulnerable. Pfft, what could ever possibly happen to me, right? I got Macs. I got security. I've got, you know, up the wazoo. Well, one day, actually, it was just last year, right around uh, June, um, I upgraded our system, and in our system we'd put in a new uh, check, and actually R&D was actually asking me to help them test. It was anti-bot detection, bot, you know, people getting infected. If you see bot activity, you would try to catch it. Well, the moment I turned it on, and again, I didn't turn it on with anything other than detect because I didn't take it that seriously. I'm not going to have bots. I got Macs. Who the heck's going to hack me? But then I noticed this hit every day. It was paying. I'm like, huh, well, that's, that's something going on. So I clicked on it to take a closer look, and I realized what it was picking up was there was a DNS lookup for a site that was known to be potentially dangerous, but it couldn't tell much more beyond that until I turned on something called a DNS trapper. And all that does basically is the firewall actually responds with its address for the, for the DNS location and essentially proxies the connection through so it can take a closer look, figure out exactly what's going on, and establish if it's good or bad. So I thought, you know what, maybe I'll just turn that on and, and see what happens. And, uh, of course, I flick it on, and lo and behold, by the next day, uh, I got a significant jump in activity. Huh. I think I have a bot in my house. Well, who could it be? I mean, my wife? Yeah, she'll pretty much click anything. Send it to her. She'll click it a couple times if it looks like it doesn't work. <laughs> Kids are downloading stuff that, you know, may be questionable. So who do you think this horrible person that brought a bot into my network was? Any guesses? Yeah. It was me. I was horrified to discover that as I clicked through, I'm like, oh my goodness, who, who could this terrible person be? Here's the 104 entries of the actual communications being monitored. 
Uh, and lo and behold, it was actually this machine right here. Now, of course, this blew my mind. I'm like, oh my God. And I panicked, of course, like most people do, and immediately looked up all eight botnets that existed for the Mac and started searching through my Mac, but I didn't find anything. And then suddenly it hit me. Oh, I have a virtual machine running Windows. I don't use it much, but it's there. And of course, it's actually not listed as a very dangerous uh, uh, bot. It's got the greens. It's there, but it's not doing much. Well, sure enough, in my virtual machine that I truthfully barely turn on, I got a bot. I don't know where it came from. Uh, it was luckily this MSN bot that uh, uh, just, I, I don't use MSN, so it was a big deal. Just captured your credentials and spammed your friends. But because I'd never actually initiated any kind of connection to MSN, it just kind of sat there just doing a heartbeat, saying, I'm here, I'm waiting. Uh, so it was fairly easy, the image of VMware machine, problem solved. So I'm still feeling really good, right? I got Max, I got all this security, I have no problems. But then a week later, something scary happened. And all of a sudden I started to get the big red hits. And when I took a closer look, it was my son on his Mac Pro. And he really did have a Mac bot. And I thought, how could this happen? I mean, that my, my invulnerability feeling suddenly went away very quickly. It slipped right through. Uh, and then something very disturbing hit me. I went back through the logs and I noticed a week before that, uh, I actually had a protection that was detected that uh, coincidentally enough allowed a remote exploit uh, on a QuickTime. And the part that upset me the most was I'd had this protection already, but it was sitting in detect mode. And you know why? Because I'm this old time IPS guy that goes, well, I'm going to download the signatures. I'm going to put them in detect mode. I'm going to monitor it for a while. And then when I feel comfortable as the administrator, I'll start enforcing things if I feel it's right. But of course, Things are moving way too fast. That, that mentality worked great for me 10 years ago when I was in the trenches. It worked actually fantastic. Uh, in this day and age, uh, it's just coming too fast and furious. I don't have time to keep up with it. Um, and also, the other part I wasn't thinking about is, and this is the most ridiculous part, I know where all these signatures are coming from. I know who's generating this. I've sat with the people writing them. And we've got this massive infrastructure, this whole team of people that do nothing but analyze and push this stuff out. So at some point, I've got to learn to trust them and just accept that I'm going to go straight to a, a block mode and turn it off in the event of a problem. I've got to do the reverse of what I traditionally thought of. Uh, and that's truthfully just to, to kind of keep up with things. But let's leave the, the whole security aspect aside. We know about this. This is pretty straightforward. I want to talk about the kind of things that your security learns about you. Uh, so I have, of course, in my infrastructure, Everybody can come in. I've got these wonderful enterprise grade tools just sitting around that I can play with and try all the time. Uh, I get tons of information about the family and things they're doing. Like, for example, my son who's using Hamachi, he thinks I don't, I don't know, uh, tunneling, you know, not really sure what out. He says he uses it for gaming, but, you know, I'll reserve judgment for now. Uh, we're fairly open with the kids. Um, I also have, you know, DLP on. You guys have seen and heard about my, uh, my DLP policy. I think we talked about it last time. Those of you who haven't seen it, this is actually my DLP policy at home. Yes, I run data loss prevention at home. It's probably one of the most valuable things I've ever done. Uh, a couple of things I look for is credit card numbers. If I see that, my wife's buying something. It's a problem. <laughs> I also look for common medical terms. For thinking, well, why on earth would you do that? Well, I have children that grew up with Google uh, their whole life. If they have a medical or, or health-related question about their bodies as they're growing up, are they going to ask me or are they going to ask Google? It's kind of like an early warning system, and it's actually scary when it hits. Uh, I also look for inappropriate language and personal, uh, personal information leaking. Um, so I can pick up all kinds of interesting things. Like, for example, uh, my daughter posted one day a picture, tagged my wife, flags the DLP, and I can quickly look it up and see that, oh, yeah, she was just posting a picture when we were in New York City because uh, she saw something. It's very, very interesting because people, when I talk to customers, they tell me, oh, you know, we plugged in this tool and we found out people are using Facebook. Well, I could have told you that. But what are they doing on Facebook? What are they posting? What kind of information is out there? That's the more interesting part, uh, the more important piece. Now, of course, part of what I run here is I actually run uh, a guest network uh, in my environment. If you want to come by my house and connect to my Wi-Fi, be my guest. Absolutely, literally. Uh, and of course, I do get a fair bit of traffic on here. You can connect, it's open, it's completely open, uh, except for uh, a little login page where really uh, it's just, uh, it's open, you know, you just give me your name, uh, your email, and your favorite number, your favorite movie if you like. 
you also have to agree to my terms of service, uh, which look a little bit like this. Uh, very long and convoluted. They used to be very simple. It used to be a very, very simple uh, uh, agreement where, you know, kind of the background was like, basically I was saying, look, your data is mine. Um, do whatever I want with it, including broadcast it to random strangers like yourselves. Now, I, I decided actually to go a little further. I went to <laughs> Google and Facebook. I went to Google, I went to Facebook, I went to all these different sites, iTunes, and I took their terms of service, and I built this based on theirs. And you know, it wasn't a dramatic change from the basically, your data is mine, and I'll do whatever I want. Uh, it just sounded more serious. Of course, I, I, you know, if you read something like this, would you still connect to that, that Wi-Fi? Or would you be, you know, oh, I don't like those terms of service. I'm going to say no. By the way, just for reference, I have a 150 megabit internet service in my house. So it's a pretty decent service if you want to connect. Uh, you can go crazy. I have limitation warranties. Um, I should get evaluated by a lawyer to see if I'm covered. Also, under, I discovered under Canadian law, unless I do this, I could actually get in a lot of trouble for what I'm about to show you. So without going too much into this detail. So who on earth would sign up for something like that? Well, folks, I'd like you to meet Tony. <laughs> uh, Tony can be reached at tmarcon.hotmail.com. Favorite movies, King Kong. Please call him Tony. Or then here's Mitch. Uh, Mitch was an interesting guy because Mitch spent a lot of time in my network. Enough time for me to figure out a few things about Mitch. L let me share them with you now. Uh, Mitch, of course, <laughs> Uh, uses Windows. Uh, when I did a deeper look at terms of what he was actually, he's running Windows Vista. Uh, I can even get right down to the service pack level. Uh, he's running Adobe, which is, you know, not shocking. Everybody runs Adobe, right, at some point. His favorite web browser is Mozilla. That's his preference. He pretty much browsed everything with Mozilla. Uh, of course, he's running Java, which at the time didn't seem like that much of a big a deal, but, you know, lately has actually become more interesting. Uh, he's also a Skype user, likes to chat with his friends over Skype. Uh, of course, he uses Facebook, right? Who doesn't use Facebook these days? Remember, no certificates were harmed in the making of this presentation. Now, of course, Facebook's encrypted, so I couldn't see much beyond him going to Facebook, right? Uh, wrong. Uh, here's uh, Mitch's girlfriend. Uh, here's a picture of Mitch when he was a kid. Uh, Mitch had an unnatural fascination with Freddy Krueger. Uh, he looked at literally dozens and dozens of pictures of him. I think maybe he's preparing for a uh, uh, I don't know, uh, um, Halloween costume or something. I don't know, it wasn't even really near Halloween, so I couldn't quite figure that one out. Uh, of course, uh, he also has a Facebook chat, and I just wanted to point out that uh, without going into too much detail, I could actually pull the URL for the chat right down to the IDs of everybody he talks to. You know what that means, right? Now I knew who all Mitch's friends are. You just punch in that ID, you go right to Facebook, and you see who Mitch likes to hang out with. Um, he's also a bit of a gamer because he ended up going to Yahoo and, asked, and looking up this question. So he must have got himself a copy of NHL 10 and decided how to go all the way in pro mode. He's also a fan of anime because he went to this website and he watched this video and then he watched this video. But don't worry, folks. Mitch has security. He's safe, right? <laughs> now let's think about this for a second. We have this unknown person. Well, actually, let's not say unknown. We got this guy, Mitch, <laughs> uh, hanging around my network on this free Wi-Fi, running assorted applications. And if I go over 2012, uh, I did a quick listing of any critical, just the critical vulnerabilities that would allow me to actually hijack the whole system. Uh, you collapse that together. I have 165 attack vectors available in just those three applications while he's sitting there. Uh, and that's, you know, things I could go after from, uh, from a remote perspective. I also know who his friends are and what his interests are. So I ask you, how hard would it be to craft an email or a link or drag him somewhere and with all this information that I know? And by the way, having brought up the point that I also know a lot about his operating system and he's sitting on my network. So, of course, going directly to the operating system would be extremely easy. Now, of course, we're all going to laugh at, at Mitch and go, well, you know, I'm not that stupid. I would never do anything like that. And it's true. But there's a slight problem with this, and that is, what if Mitch isn't the person I'm interested in? What if it's Mitch's friends? Because I'll use Mitch to get to everybody else who's doing the best they possible can. Um, I actually had some friends uh, uh, block me from, from Facebook recently because I complained bitterly about their their constant need to click everything in front of them, apparently a couple of times. 
uh, and you know all the stupid spam, and I would scold them for it. I would point it out, and I'd say, "You people, stop clicking this stuff. What's wrong with you?" And they go, "Man, well, I'll click whatever I want. What, what does it matter?" And I'm like, "You know, it's, this is my account." And I'm like, "But you're putting me at risk because I've chosen to be friends with you." And they're like, "Well, I don't want to be friends with you." I'm like, "Perfect. This is working out well for both of us." Move along. We'll stick to phone calls. Uh, actually, it's, it's been a few contentious thing with my wife and some of her friends because I'm like, I don't want these people on my network. There's something wrong with them. They'll click whatever they want. But you take a look at, at uh, and by the way, if you think I'm being too harsh on these people, I do have it set up so that if you hang around my network for too long, uh, I will jump back in and remind you with a little pop-up, you know, before you go to whatever it is you're going to. Just a little reminder, I'm going to come with you. I'm going to help myself to... Whatever it is uh, uh, you're doing, you know, hey, why not, right? So when we look at all these things that we're doing from a guest perspective, I thought, this is pretty busy. It's pretty active. I'm getting actually a, a lot of activity. This, there was far more than uh, Mitch in there. I actually know so much about my neighbors. It's incredible. I've never even met most of them. Um, I'm waiting for that one moment where you have that neighbor standoff over some issue, and I go, oh, buddy, you don't want to go there. I know everything about you. You know nothing about me. So I thought actually I'd update you know, my login to say, you know what, I'm going to ask for the name, email, I'm going to requirement, and I'm going to actually ask a requirement for a phone number. I left the favorite movie there one. I thought if this works out well, maybe I'll add you know, social insurance number, credit card, see how far we can go with this. Hey, you got your passport number handy. Free Wi-Fi. Who would possibly agree to something like that, right? Well, folks, I'd like you to meet Manny. Manny can be reached at 647-888-9047. I don't know if it's a real number. I've never called him, but uh, feel free if you like. But then I decided I would take this to a new level. And I took our DLP engine, and I created a new data set. And this new data set is called Conversations. And I called it that because I literally just went to, to Google. And I decided, well, you know, what's the most common words used when people are talking, when people are chatting? And uh, of course, it was a very quick search, and all of a sudden, you know, I found a you know thousand of the most common, four thousand of the most common. There's tons of databases like this, simple CSV format. Uh, and so I actually didn't even take the top, uh, you know, four thousand. I actually think I took about fifty or hundred of them, the top ones. And I plunked it in a data set and said, well, anybody that comes into my guest network, going anywhere, I just want to detect this. And the amount of information that came flooding in was stunning to me. So enough that uh, I actually thought I'd create a little movie about it. Um, I, well, that's what I like to do, right? I, I get stuck on planes a lot, so I collect data, I play with it. Um, so I'd like to share with you now uh, my movie. I call it DLP, A Love Story. It's fascinating. I've got a whole soap opera happening around my network. I could just sit and pour through DLP logs all day. And I wasn't kidding when I said I've, I've learned a lot about what's going on in my environment. And let me show you just how detailed this can get. Um, so we're going to pick on, uh, on Ronnie here. Uh, Ronnie came in and decided to uh, hang around my network for an inordinate amount of time, actually about 72 hours. 
uh, he hung around with. Um, so of course, I, I, you know, and this is one example of, of many streams of data, so to speak, that came through. So I saw a piece of data come through. It says, if you like what you see, don't be afraid of it. Okay. I'm not afraid. Let's see what we got here. So I started digging through the information there. And of course, when I pull up this description field of what was posted, ugh, these online dating sites can be such a drag. But anyways, a little about myself, an electrical contractor. I'm like, OK, that's kind of interesting. Let's see where this is coming from. And he was going to a place at POF.com. I found out that stood for plentyoffish.com. Does anybody know that site? Dead silence. It's a dating site. <laughs> I didn't know. I've been married for a while, so it wasn't really uh, something I was aware of. But I thought, OK, that's kind of cool. Now keep in mind, on top of the DLP stuff I'm collecting, I'm also collecting every URL and website he goes to. And of course, I can correlate them together. So after creating this profile, uh, our friend here then proceeded to go to this girl's profile and send her this private message. Well, private between us, right? Uh, amazing smile, you just made my day. Now I know where to look to break my day when I'm having a dull day, Gwen, sweet and thanks. And then about a minute later, he went to this girl's profile and he sent her this message. Uh, just looking at your photo, I think you're my kind of lady. Don't even need to read your profile. You look so simple yet so darn hot. Did he just call her simple? <laughs> I know I've been out of the dating scene for a long time, but that doesn't strike me as a good thing to do. I need to get the injection part of DLP go, buddy, you don't want to do that. <laughs> then he went to this girl's site, sent her this message. Uh, nice long dragging on, uh, short line worth. He says she's sexy for 32 years old. So now he's calling her old. <laughs> this guy needs help. But anyway. I started to wonder, I'm like, well, what other things can I find out about this person, right? I'm, this is a very passive thing where I'm just seeing, you know, where he's going, what he's looking at. And when I took a closer look, of course, there is more information I capture as part of the DLP. I'm capturing the whole session. Uh, and sure enough, when I looked, there was actually a whole header with cookie. And when I drilled down and went deeper into the cookie, I discovered this field, username, Fantabulous Frazier. So I went to plentyoffish.com, punched in Fantabulous Frazier, ta-da! Ugh, these online dating sites can be such a drag. Ugh, these online dating sites can be such a drag. There's my guy. Now, here's what's interesting. I recognize this neighborhood. That's actually his house. Do you know what's sitting right behind his house? My house. Free Wi-Fi, right? But here's where things can get dangerous for uh, our friend Frazier. I could start building, you know, compound data types looking for some very specific things. Uh, you know. Uh, for example, like credit card information. Maybe I could exclude it, of course, but I can also start to target what it is I want to extract about them. And the reason I find this uh, interesting and, and powerful is if you think about it, these tools are sitting in our offices and our companies. And I don't know how many companies I talk to where it's, well, what kind of process do you have? Oh, well, it's Sally is the firewall person. She looks after everything. She's great, so we just let her take care of it. I wonder how many companies realize what they've handed over to these people. What kind of information they have? How hard would it be to create a targeted, you know, I could use the credit card of the CFO of the company. That could be kind of handy for my trip to Vegas. How hard would it be to build a data set search that would pluck that out, that would find it, or the chance, of course, they're using it online. Now, I want to make clear that a lot of the analysis and things that you're seeing here um, is people tend to get zeroed in on the tool itself. Ooh, look at that pretty tool. And it, don't get me wrong, it's pretty. It's a big enterprise product, a lot of uh, developers on it. But what I'm doing here is not you know, dramatic in the sense that you couldn't build this sort of thing in your home. It's just this is designed for a scale of you know, potentially thousands of users. In your home, a little bit of work. It won't be as pretty graphically, but uh, you could actually build this kind of search. This is not outrageous technology in the sense of what it's doing. But what's interesting to me is that we think these tools are going to tell us the information when really they just collect the data, right? They just tell us what's going on. And the context I can get when I'm using it is, I know my kids, I know my wife, I know a lot of my friends that come on. So when I look at this data, I can make sense of it, I can relate it. I have something very important. I have context, right? It's not just data sets for me. It's not like thousands of people I have to think about. I don't quite have the context of what's going on with you know, some of my neighbors and that, but of course I'm learning more and more about them as I go along. And as I said, remember, no certificates were harmed in the creation of this. Now, I could go a step further. I could inject the SSL certs onto my family, decrypt all their SSL, but with the amount of data I'm already collecting, I know everybody says, oh, everything's going SSL. 
but I'm actually finding it not so much. There's still a whole lot of information I'm extracting without it. We'll see as time goes on. Maybe the next time I come up here, I'll be... Okay, so I went with the SSL decryption, and here's where it goes. By the way, with the guess, based on the information I'm collecting, it should be too hard to get them to install my cert. Would you agree? Now, every organization, my own included, love to do these 2013 uh, you know, or 2000, you know, security reports. Uh, my company's no different. They collect all this data that we're searching. We scrub it, and we present it. Um, I thought I'd actually give you my own version of this. Uh, this would be the 2000 security report from Kelman based purely on my house over the course of the year. I have, well, I'll have a year's worth of data, but I thought I'd just do a rundown of 2012 and share with you some of the things I'm able to see and understand based on context, of course. And the big one I learned is, of course, most of my traffic is media sharing, and of course, of that media sharing, the lion's share of it is, of course, is, this is my son, this is my daughter, uh, and this is our Apple TVs. They don't have a username, hence the uh, inapplicable. So if you look at like three quarters of the stuff they're doing, uh, is all YouTube. And of course, this uh, actually allowed me to make a business decision in the house because I realized my children don't watch TV. The concept of TV, actually turning it on and looking at a channel, is ridiculous to them. Now, it never crossed my mind that that would be a problem. My wife and I, you know, still somewhat, actually, I'm less so now because I travel a lot. But they have no interest in it. If they can't point and click and watch it immediately, they're not interested. I wonder how many. TV companies and cable providers realize that when my you know, son and daughter get into the real world, TV isn't the last thing on their list to buy. It's not on the list. That TV is nothing more than, especially the Apple TV, is just send their, their data up. Their friends come over, and my daughter has a sleepover. Her friends will come over, and they sit there with their iPhones and fire up uh, their videos and stuff onto the, uh, you know, through YouTube and stuff on the TV all night. They'll do that happily all night. Never once turn on the TV. Uh, as a matter of fact, it got to the point where I'd received a letter from my, my satellite subscriber. I thought it was junk mail, so I kind of threw it to the side, and I was about to throw it out, and I realized, ooh, this doesn't look like junk. I opened it up, and it says, we've decommissioned your receiver. Please contact, I've been a long-time user of their services. Please contact us, and we'll send you a, a new receiver. But make sure you get a hold of us before July 1st, otherwise you're going to lose your TV service. At this point, it's July 15th. And I'm like, huh. I go over, I turn on the TV, black, nothing. Nobody in the house has said a word. <laughs> well, I'm thinking, ah, it's summer, right? Nobody's really watching a lot of TV anyway. No big deal. I'll wait until September. And of course, by you know, mid to end of September, nobody said a word. So I finally say to the family, hey, you guys know the TV's dead. And of course, the kids right away go, there's something wrong with the Apple TV? No, no, the Apple TV's fine. The satellite's gone. And they all went, oh, went right back to eating. <laughs> Could care less. Uh, so as a consequence, I, I've realized that uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't really need service. Well, I actually canceled the kids' package right away. They never noticed or cared. Uh, and I'm a little disillusioned with the TV. However, I keep it to say that at least I'm pay trying to pay something. Uh, and that's a prelude to, it's another presentation I'm working on that maybe I'll uh, see you with next week. Um, one other element I thought you'd find interesting, I found interesting. Now, this is the list of the top users that have come to my network. I know a lot of them. There's a good friend of my son's who stays over a lot. He'll come and stay a week at a time. He lives out in the country to friends, at my friend's place, so 150 megabit internet service is like the biggest thrill in the world for him. Uh, so he likes to come over and spend a lot of time. That, that, of course, is probably not very interesting to you, but there is something very interesting I found, which I thought I would like to share with you. Every one of these people the first time they come to my network, sends off this piece of data and then never send it again, no matter how many times they come back. They come back with a new machine, they'll send this off again. But everybody, does anybody know what this is? You got it. Anybody realize the extent to which they're doing this? So right now, this, if you, it's a lot to read right here, but basically what's happening is this is a list of every Wi-Fi hotspot in my neighborhood, not just mine, complete with signal strength, uh, signal noise ratio, SSID information, everything. It gathered all that and fires it off to Google. Everybody does that when they connect. How many people are aware of that? I mean, you've heard of it. <laughs> One person? Come on, you other people have seen this. I, I didn't actually realize what this was until I looked it up and then I realized people were identifying it's happening. Uh, every one of our devices, every time you find a new Wi-Fi, send an update to Google and apparently now the NSA as well, right? Um, does everybody remember the swear chart? The last time I presented, have you guys seen the swear chart? So of course, I look for inappropriate language. 
Uh, would you like to see the summary of the 2012 swear chart? Who doesn't love the swear chart? So this is uh, the top swearers for the year. Uh, of course, as expected, my wife came in at number one. Uh, bit of a potty mouth, but hey, what are you going to do? Uh, my, actually, this is deceiving. My son isn't really second. My daughter, due to a, a change in equipment, uh, actually got split across here for a couple of entries. So she's, at, uh, she's technically a little bit above them. Uh, I'm in there as well. And then, of course, you know, there are guests in there. Now, are you curious on what the top 10 inappropriate language used in my uh, network is over the course of an entire year? Let's look. Take a look. Now, this actually kind of threw me. There's a whole bunch of porn. The word porn, right? It's classified as inappropriate language. Uh, the other ones I kind of, you know, made sense. A couple of them made me a little nervous, but whatever. Uh, you know, that's life. But I looked at it, I realized, oh my God, like, who the heck is talking about porn so much? What's, what's with all the porn? And when I drilled down, you know what it was? It was actually my wife on social networking complaining to many of her friends over and over again over the course of the year that she can't watch porn online because her husband will see it <laughs> and that would be embarrassing. <laughs> I had no idea this was a problem. She never mentioned it to me. <laughs> well, and sure enough, when I went to look, uh, I had to cut this off because I don't want you to see just how much porn my daughter watches. Um, we, we have a very uh, open relationship with the kids. I, I took this attitude at a young age to say, you know what? I'm not going to put these barriers up in the kids. Whatever they want to talk about, we're very open about. And the end result is, I mean, she'll not only surf all the porn she wants, knowing full well I see it, she'll come and tell me, oh, I saw it. And it's like, you have no idea how, horrif how horrifying that is as a father <laughs> to have to grit and go, that's nice, honey. <laughs> I'm going to go in the corner, bang my head against the wall for a bit. <laughs> so, of course, I, she was right, actually. She was, truthfully, that, that little hit is really just enough to qualify as porn ads from, you know, whatever site. She never actually looked at porn. Well, I felt pretty bad about that, so uh, I put in a very special rule for her that says, Cindy, you can go to the internet for any sex-related site, and the firewall, and by extension myself, will completely ignore it. We don't have to look at it. We don't have to, to do anything. So I'm like, honey, surf all the porn you want. I didn't realize it was a problem. You probably should have let me know. Uh, I didn't you know, need to see it. Um, but of course, there's a problem, right? How does she know I'm going to leave this rule in, right? I could easily flip it on her. She doesn't really understand the technology. In the IT world that we live in, we have these wonderful tools like governance, risk, and compliance that allow us to track, you know, how people are, you know, based on standards. We've got, you know, distributed, you know, uh, a tiers of administrators that can monitor and make sure that we're doing the things we want to do. But what happens, you know, when it's a home or when it's something you don't control? Uh, because this information uh, really comes down to people's lives. It's not just information I'm collecting. It's not just raw data. Uh, there's tons of things going on in terms of what people are looking at. And of course, you know, this, is, this statement couldn't be more, uh, I guess, relevant based on the recent uh, events we've seen in the news. Um, of course, what worries me when I think about this, you think about what I'm doing on a macro scale when the government steps in and the things they're doing. Um, there's all these, you know, oh, of course, they've been telling us for years, we've got to secure the internet, save the, save the internet, and we're going to have the ISP store all this information because, you know, we have to be able to track it. We have to be able to track what's doing. And I ask, you know, I wonder what it is they're really collecting about us, what it is they have. Uh, in my own country, we're, we're just as bad. It's not just a U.S. thing. This is worldwide. In Canada, Canada, they took this attitude of, oh, we have to have this bill where the ISPs are required to store all this data and this information uh, because we have to stop the child pornographers. And if you're not, if you don't agree with this idea, Clearly, you're a child porn supporter. What a great way to shut up anyone from arguing with them, right? Uh, but of course, you know, uh, this didn't actually work out so well for our own uh, Vic Toes in, in, uh, in Canada. He, uh, he actually uh, attracted the attention of Anonymous, who pro promptly doxed him and exposed or a fairy was having and all this kind of stuff. Maybe give him a little dose of what it's like to lose your privacy on the internet. Uh, but of course, they also had the alter effect where he, he Vic got up and goes, well, see? Because of what Anonymous did, we clearly have to do this. It didn't really help us. And of course, I'm under no delusion of who's really driving this and what they really want to do with it. Uh, they don't really want me to, uh, to protect child pornographers. They really want to go after, you know, Joe Public, uh, sell information to the record industry, the entertainment industry. There's a lot of powerful lobbyists. Let's not be delusional. Uh, there are alternative methods for this. 
And the other aspect is, is they believe that somehow there's this magic electronic brain that can take all this data with really no context of who we are as people and make sense of it. No, oh, well, something bad's happening. And of course, this presentation was based on the concept of this could be happening. I can now take this to, oh, this is absolutely happening. Uh, they are collecting this data. You guys, have you seen the slides from this? What a terrible template, eh? They couldn't invest in more, you know. Now, I, I find it interesting, the type of prism. So, of course, apparently at Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, everybody is, is now throwing out data to the NSA, to the government, so that they can have, you know, all the data and information they need about, uh, well, it's supposed to be to track foreigners like myself, which is kind of funny because I already gave up my entire life uh, to the U.S. government so that I could cross the border unfeathered, right? And it's, eh, it's a trade-off I made, and actually it's pretty cool. Um, so I, I'm not really worried, but you guys are, of course, wrapped up in the mix, too. Um, and, of course, now they're saying, oh, we didn't do it, we didn't do it, of course, what else would they say? But actually, I, I, I tend to maybe believe them because of the name of the, the program, PRISM. They got a way to tap in fiber. You think there's any kind of connection to PRISM, fiber? I, I don't know. Maybe they're just figured out how to tap into these spots. Uh, it's kind of interesting. And, of course, the details they're going down to, um, uh, Skype really surprised me, right? Skype's encrypted. I kind of wonder if the timing of the selling to eBay or or Microsoft was right around when they suddenly were able to listen to Skype calls and things like that. But we go on and on. Of course, now, they would never abuse something like this, right? This is always to protect us. That would never happen. Uh, I found this actually happened in uh, Hawaii. This is interesting. Uh, the senator put in a bill that was going to require everybody, even like coffee shops, to sort data so they could track anyone they wanted. Coincidentally enough, uh, she had gone through a situation where her web designer, she got in a conflict with her web designer who hacked her email, and I guess at that point realized, and the cops said, nothing we can do, no logs. We have to fix that. But that was clearly a personal vendetta. And that scares me when people have this kind of uh, uh, data. Uh, there's always going to be an element of abuse. Right? Think about the massive amount of resources it requires to control this. But the bigger thing that frightens me all in this, is it frightens me more in all of this, is when you think about how this data is being collected, and they've got this magic brain that's supposedly going to process it all and understand it and be able to call the information with, you know, oh, we don't need the context, we'll just know. But I, I wonder how they can figure out what's bad and necessarily related to what appears to be bad. And by that I mean, is this really some kind of nefarious thing floating by? Or is it some botnet that's in control of me? They talk about chasing child pornographers. Do you really think child pornographers are going to store the data on their own machines? Or are they going to store it on the machines of the people they've hacked? I know already, we've already established, the attacks are coming in fast and furious. With all the security I have in my house, I still got a botnet in there. All right? How is Joe Public possibly going to defend themselves in this type of environment? I think, we, we, well, we know what's happening. They have to kind of... You reach this happy, hopefully you get a bot herder that likes to look after a machine and takes care of you. That's about the best they can hope for. <laughs> but is the government going to take that into consideration when they see traffic coming from your machine? Oh, well, it could be a botnet. I mean, as security companies, we're challenged enough trying to figure that out. And somehow, the NSA and everybody else seems to tell us, well, we can figure it out. It worries me a lot. Now, in terms of what we could do about it, um, I'm afraid that, so we here in this room, and the reason we're here is, we get it. We understand just how ugly this can and will get. Unfortunately, most of the other people I talk to just don't care. Don't know about it. Don't realize it. And I think something we can do as part of a security community is we reach out to each other all the time and complain about this. How often do you reach out to the friends and family that don't necessarily understand this and make sure they understand? Uh, because it's going to take more than us uh, to, to actually bring this down, to stop this sort of activity from happening. So I want you to consider taking the time to talk to friends and family. I normally shy away from it. I, tell, I try to tell my family uh, I'm, I worked at Best Buy because you know you show up at the family reunion, I'm like, oh, you're in computers? I have this problem with my Windows machine. <laughs> oh, yeah, we never hear that, right? Actually, I, I'll, I'll give you a tip for that. I, I carry around a USB stick with uh, Ubuntu on it, and they're like, oh, can you fix it? I'm like, oh, I can fix that, absolutely. I go right in, I slam the USB, I reboot onto the USB stick and go, there, problem solved. And they're like, oh, what happened to my PC? And I'm like, oh, no, it's gone. Don't worry about it. I fixed all your problems. <laughs> then they freak out for a while, and then I go, ha-ha, and I unplug it, re reboot back the machine, and they stop asking me to even look at their machines. So just a little tip there. 
But maybe it wouldn't hurt to reach out to them at the family get-togethers and say, hey, uh, do you guys realize how, what's going on here? Tre teach your kids. Let them know what's going on. Uh, teach your family. Um, before I get wrapped up here, I think I'm getting close to the end, um, I thought I'd leave you with, uh, so one of the most asked questions I get uh, is, what on earth does your wife think of all this? <laughs> what, how does she feel about this? Because, of course, she's had to live with this a long time. Still doesn't quite grasp what I do for a living. Um, so I thought rather than you know, circumvent that, and rather than speak on her behalf, I thought I'd let her tell you for me what she thinks of all this. Everybody, this is my wife, Cindy. So it's a whole new game for everybody. And by the way, if it's not me monitoring, you know, it's also our government, politics, bad guys, anyway. Right? So uh, what, if I could offer you an extra layer of protection on that as well. Against government? Yeah. I think not. <laughs> well, matter of fact, I think you have some in the house, don't you? What kind of TV shows do you watch again? And uh, which, do, you, do you subscribe to HBO? Uh, no. And do you enjoy your HBO shows? Have you ever gotten an email saying, hey, stop downloading, uh, you're violating copyright? Have you ever had anyone knock at the door or serve you papers? So <laughs> there's a level of protection there, too. <laughs> right, so thumbs up or thumbs down on the security. <laughs> well, I can turn it off tomorrow, you know, leave you clear and naked on the internet. So she grudgingly accepts it for uh, what it's worth. Uh, listen, I want to thank everybody for your time. I hope this was uh, helpful, informative in some way, or at least a little bit entertaining. Uh, and please spread the word. Make sure that everybody around you knows the kind of things that are going on, because we actually have some serious issues coming upon us uh, related to kind of monitoring then. And if you see what I can do in my house, granted I have, again, access to probably bigger stuff that's prettier, imagine the kind of things they're doing at the levels above us. So anyway. Enjoy the rest of the show, everybody. Thank you to all the organizers. This is fantastic. And uh, let's have a great time, guys. Take care.